less than 24 hours, Georgians will be under a shelter-in-place order. McDonald, though, said he did not know the man was handcuffed and was trying to use his foot to pin him to the ground so he could be handcuffed. If your friends, neighbors, or local organizations are not complying, report them to us. Howdy, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Free Georgia Podcast. Today we kick off Gun Month here at the Libertarian Party of Georgia. We're going to be talking about guns and uh, everything related to guns uh, for this entire month, mostly on the podcast. Um, next week, we're going to have Mr. Edgar Mills join us um, from, uh, where is he from? Osprey Shooting Solutions. Um, where uh, the LP will be having an event later this month, I believe on the 23rd, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that next week. Um, this week, it's just me. I'm solo. Uh, it'll be a shorter episode because I'm tired, y'all. I've been renovating two bathrooms in my house, just me and my wife, and my parents came out to help for a few days. And uh, let me tell you, it is not easy to renovate two bathrooms at the same time. We have to shower at our next door neighbor's house. <laughs> Thank goodness we have great neighbors. Uh, thank you, William and Claire. Um, it, uh, it's also just today was so stinking hot. Today was so hot. I think uh, my neighbor told me that in his, on his job site, the weather said it felt like 115 degrees. I think it's just because of the daggum humidity here in Georgia, which is my least favorite kind of heat. I'm originally from Texas, and uh, as hot as it gets there, it uh, unless you're in Houston, it's not really a wet heat. It's a very dry heat, which I'm much more of a fan of. Uh, it's just easier to handle for me, I guess, because I'm accustomed to it. Also, when you hear me taking sips um, or see me taking sips of something during this podcast, it's only going to be Guinness. Let's get that label in there. So if my one of my goals for this podcast is to have Guinness be one of our sponsors. So if anybody out there from Guinness is uh, watching and you'd like to sponsor a podcast that has literally hundreds of views each week, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I'd be more than happy to take your phone call. Oh my gosh, Guinness is so good. All right. Um, we'll start off with the sad news. A few shootings on the 4th of July. It is never a good thing. It's uh, never a good thing for the people involved. It's horrific, tragic. Um, yeah, I just started picturing myself being at one of those, at one of those parades, um, one of the fireworks shows and that happening. And man, that, that is hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to wrap your head around the psyche of someone who would do something like that. Um, and I also think that not being able to understand it makes us far more fearful and act in fear rather than strength and compassion. Um, every single time there's a shooting, People who are anti-gun want more gun control, and people who are pro-gun um, don't really show enough compassion and empathy, in my in my opinion. Um, a lot of the time, some people definitely do, um, but a lot of the stuff, I mean, Twitter's pretty toxic, but a lot of the stuff on Twitter can get pretty uh, morally repugnant. I guess <laughs> um, would be the term for it. And it, it, it can be pretty depressing. Um, just the aftermath of, of how people react to these kinds of shootings. But um, I guess to talk about it for a second, uh, the one in Illinois Highland park was, let's see, the specifics were Illinois is in, they have red flag laws in place. Um, they have a ban on high capacity magazines. They have a ban on assault weapons, quote unquote. Um, and yet it still happened. Um, and these are the exact laws 
and um, things that people want to put in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening. So if that's just, if that's not enough proof to demonstrate that these red flag laws, these, this gun control agenda that people have, it just doesn't work. Um, and it doesn't work for many reasons, but one of which is that I think we have a massive cultural problem here in the U S. Um, and it could extend abroad. I don't know. I haven't been abroad, um, really since 2016. So not quite sure how things are over there at this point, but, um, we definitely have some type of deep cultural problem here in the U S and probably not just one, probably very many, but, um, man, it just, to pair that with what has happened the past two years, um, with lockdowns and people feeling isolated and, um, told not to come out of their houses and basically told what to do and how to live for a year and a half, two years, watching their savings go down the toilet, watching, um, people lose their jobs, uh, the economy tank, um, just watching all these horrible things happen because of government lockdowns. Um, I'm sure it's taken its toll on a whole bunch of people. Um, and it's just very unfortunate circumstance that we find ourselves in. And as a libertarian, I blame the government. (laughs) I at least blame the government for the lockdown portion of everything. Um, the cultural problem I'm I'm not sure exactly where that would stem from. Um, I should probably do a little more research and digging and thinking about that. Um, but from my perspective, uh, a lot of it, a lot of the things that you see in these shootings today are cultural. And um, what I've noticed most um, about the culture these days is how much people are obsessed with themselves and the idea of me. And I'm certainly guilty of this. Um, Not all the time, but I I strive very hard to focus on other people, definitely focus on my wife, try to focus on her more than me and other people's needs. But with the emergence of social media and um, basically the how it's taken over the world and taken over our it's, it's replaced human interaction with digital interaction between humans. And there's already enough, (laughs) um, before social media, before the internet, before any of this stuff, there was already enough miscommunications and, uh, misinterpretings, um, when people would have in-person conversations. And when you add, the digital aspect of it, when there's no inflection, you're not looking into the other person's eyes. You can't tell the meaning behind it. Are they joking? Are they being serious? Um, it just adds to a whole new, it just adds a whole new level of, of detachment, um, from reality and not having to see the person you're talking to and see their emotions and how they react to things. Um, and kind of feel that humanness, uh, is a huge issue in my opinion. That's why I, I, I prefer to do interviews during these podcasts in person because there's s- some type of energy when there are two people in a room rather than two people talking through a screen. Um, and don't get me wrong. I love the talking through a screen and I like, um, being able to see what my friends are up to. Um, and, you know, follow my family and show them things and, um, post random crap. Um, but there is some very negative consequences that come from being obsessed with, um, your online presence. And, um, it all becomes about the likes, the reactions, um, and they're not even real reactions is the issue. They're, they're, um, they're kind of just statistics, I guess. Um, it's just kind of like, how many likes did I get? 
how many people commented, um, how many views, that kind of thing. You're not like, oh, who viewed it? Like it's, it's, it's more quantity over quality. So the more people see your stuff, the more people react to your stuff, the, the more proud of it you can be, um, which is just incorrect thinking because it's just not how life works. And the most, just trying to get the most of something, the most that you can get out of something as just a statistic um, doesn't set you up for success um, as a human. Um, you should be striving to be better each time, not get the most views or the most clicks or whatever. You should be striving to improve yourself and improve the people around you and, I don't know, help anybody that needs help. Um, I see too much, too many people bad-mouthing each other, bad-mouthing people they've never met, um, really just going after folks just because they don't share the same views. They don't have the same thought process. They don't, they, they disagree with you on something. And it's really tragic how folks will just attack random strangers online for no reason. Um, it's something that would never happen or extremely rarely happen in, in public. And I think uh, when you do this kind of thing online, you create isolation for people. Um, you, you get to, uh, the consequences are far more impactful to certain people than you could ever realize. Um, just being mean to somebody online, it might mean nothing to you and it might, um, you might not think of the consequences and that's because you don't have that personal interaction face to face. Um, so I don't know. There's just something deeper to, Oh, we have a gun problem. Uh, it, it's just not the issue there. There have always been guns in the United States and there have only been mass shootings heavily, um, over the past couple decades. Um, and man, if you it, it might not be um, definitive proof, but there is a corollary between the internet and social media coming around to when mass shootings began happening more and more in the United States. And I don't know what that uh, correlation is, and I don't know how how tied it is to how tied they are to each other, but there is definitely something to be said about living in an internet age, living in basically your digital profile, your avatar, um, and not interacting with humans on a day-to-day -day basis and getting, I don't know, just getting involved in people's lives who are around you and subjecting yourself to isolation or just being isolated, um, especially these past two years. So, you're going to hear a lot of people say we have a gun problem. You're going to hear a lot of people say we have a mental health problem. Um, I would say we just have a culture problem. And um, one of the things I was kind of asked not to talk about on this podcast was culture, but I really just don't see how that's, that's going to be doable considering how hand in hand politics and culture go. Um, Politics is downstream from culture, and whatever happens in the culture, politics is soon to follow. Um, yeah, so I, I just don't see any way around talking about cultural issues here on this show. Um, and while that may not be thrilling to some people, um, I, I just don't think there's any way around it. Yeah, I just think it's time for a shift. I think it's time um, for a cultural shift. And I think the Libertarian Party is one of the best places that that can happen. We are all about individuality um, and being able to be yourself without hurting anybody else. And that's a pretty remarkable thing. Um, 
a lot of people want want the government to do something, want the government to take care of them. Um, think the government uh, should basically control and run our lives. Well, we definitely do not think that. We are very much for people living exactly how they would like to live. And when you have a society right now that is acting the way it does and a culture right now that seems to produce um, a large amount of killers, uh, then the people who are innocent, the people who are good citizens, the people who aren't going to hurt anybody, um, those are the ones who get punished. Um, because this kid who shot up all these people in Illinois uh, broke a bunch of laws, um, seems like had a had an online presence that was that should have tipped some people off. Um, and it did nothing to stop it. The laws did nothing to stop it. Um, all the surveillance that they do on our on our Facebook pages, Instagram accounts, all this kind of stuff did no good with stopping this guy, even though these laws were in place. Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't understand the conclusion that people reach of restricting law abiding citizens guns. That makes no sense. Um, it's completely nonsensical and the best way to protect yourself against these kinds of things happening, in my opinion, is to arm yourself. Um, learn how to use a gun properly, safely. Um, in Georgia, we have constitutional carry now, um, even though it's very frustrating. I got my concealed carry license uh, a couple years ago, and two years later, we get constitutional carry. And that whole process was freaking stupid. Took forever. Um, they have my stinking fingerprints on file now. I hate all that crap. But yeah, despite going through the concealed carry process here in Georgia, um, it's a phenomenal thing to have. Uh, I, I, f I feel much safer. I feel like I could actually do something if an incident were to occur. Um, while I'm out and about around the town, I do a lot of real estate photography. So I go into homes and buildings and all sorts of stuff all over, um, the Atlanta metro area. Um, and so there are some sketchy situations that can arise and it's nice to be able to know that I could, be able to defend myself. And that's a pretty good feeling. Um, it's a good feeling to know that when something happens, I could actually be of use um, when something crazy out in the world happens or that I can just have the ability to defend myself at any given moment. Um, it might not always go down that way. The world is a crazy place. Crazy things happen. Um, it is not inside of your control or anybody's control um, all the time, what happens to you or anybody around you. Um, many, many things are outside of your control, but what is inside of your control is how you carry yourself, how you act, how you prepare, and basically how you handle any type of situation. Um, and so taking that out of your hands and putting it into the hands of the government is easily the stupidest, most ignorant thing that people could do. If you have, if you have, if you're under this like idea that the government can help fix your problems and can swoop in and protect you when they need, when you need them to, uh, you are not a student of history. Um, really terrible crap happens all the time. And a lot of it is horrible. Um, a lot of it is avoidable. Um, the majority of terrible things that happen in the world 
the majority of killings, the majority of murders, of theft are done by the government. And this isn't news. Like, this isn't something new. It's not something that just started happening over the past few decades. It's happened for centuries and centuries and centuries. Governments are the biggest perpetrators of evil on the planet. And it's because, well, one of the reasons is because they have this sense of authority um, that they're in control, they are in charge of your life, and you will do what they say. Ours is a little bit different. Ours is more like, yeah, you, you, you go ahead and vote. You, you give us your opinions. Um, yeah, let me campaign and try to get your vote. Let me, let me share my ideas with you. Let me speak some buzzwords here and there to uh, galvanize the people. Um, and then what do they do once, once they're in office, once, uh, once they're actually ruling the country? They do nothing. Um, whether or not public support is in favor or opposed to a certain issue determines exactly 0% of whether that issue or whatever gets passed in Congress. Um, mind you, I'm talking federally right now, state by state, not so sure. But whether people are all for something or people are all against something doesn't really matter. 30% of the time, a bill is going to get passed. That's it. It doesn't matter if people are for it or against it. It only matters what the people in Washington think, in Congress at least. Um, that's not even what they think. There's a whole bunch of lobbyists, corporations pushing for stuff, um, favors being done, compromises being made that include your rights. <laughs> people make compromises using your rights as bargaining chips. It's horrifying. Um, man, I got off track real quick. It is empowering um, to be the one who is in control of your, your future, um, your own future. Um, there's, there's something to the idea of not putting your safety in the hands of somebody else or putting your livelihood in the hands of somebody else and living the way you want to live and you can live despite certain limitations in the world nowadays. Um, and not playing the blame game. Like, there are too many people that blame everything on... There are too many people that blame their woes on other people and refuse to look inward, um, which is kind of ironic considering what I was talking about at the beginning where social media has just bred a whole bunch of people to only think about themselves, but they don't actually think about themselves deeply. They think about themselves very superficially and don't ever get into the depths of who they really are. And um, it is incredibly freeing and empowering to know that no matter what happens out there, um, you're going to figure it out and you're going to be fine. Um, I, I, I've had this conversation with my wife before where I didn't really understand how people didn't feel this way. Um, I'm the kind of person who doesn't really give a crap what people say about me, what people think. Um, one of the things, one of the phrases that uh, I've, I don't know that I've ever uttered to myself about myself or, you know, to anyone else about me is uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be where I am. And according to my wife, that happens to many, 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 many people who question whether or not they're in the right place. And I just, I've, I've literally never had that thought that I'm not in the right place. I just kind of figured, hey, I am where I am. And so therefore I'm in the right place. Um, 
I also grew up Christian. Um, and so it was always the assumption that God has me here for a reason. And, uh, what that reason is, I might not know, but where I am is where I am. And he put me here. So here we go. And you just live with it. Um, I've been broke. I've been homeless for a small second. Um, I've traveled around the world. I've done a whole bunch of stuff, but one thing I never ever have done is questioned. One thing I've never done is, is felt like I was doing things incorrectly. I guess what I'm trying to say is the Libertarian Party is about individualism and individual rights, individual liberty, and myself and the rest of the LP in Georgia are here to help you understand that you are in control of your future. And when you put your future in the hands of politicians, you will be disappointed. You will not like the outcome. And it will end up costing you far more than the fear that you cannot overcome to get to a place where you are independent and um, focused on your own future um, and building that yourself. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is just take control of your own future. Stop blaming things on other people. Um, you cannot control what anybody else does. Bad things happen in the world and you cannot stop them. No one can stop them. You can't control them. The only thing you control, you can control is how you react. And since we are the party of personal responsibility and the party of principles, um, really what we want is for you to join us. Like we, we don't want division in the way that the Republicans and Democrats see division. We don't want to divide people based upon how they think about certain issues. What we want to do is show you how libertarian you actually are and why freedom, liberty, and personal responsibility are the absolute best and most empowering way to go through life. And we want to do that with kindness. We want to do that with love. We want to do that with some hard truths, um, which are going to happen no matter what. If, if, if you're truly being kind to somebody, um, not nice, those two words are not interchangeable. And it drives me nuts when people use them interchangeably. Nice is just being pleasant, being friendly. Kind is, at times, telling people the hard truth. Um, telling people what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. And the Libertarian Party is full of very nice people, very kind people. Um, we're also full of people who have seen and read and researched enough to know, to see things that other people cannot see yet. I used to be a Republican hardcore Republican. Um, I've got pictures from George W. Bush rallies that I went to when I was in high school. Um, I used to love Bernie Sanders in college. Um, and then I started reading a lot of Murray Rothbard, of Ludwig von Mises, of um, Thomas Sowell, um, Scott Horton, and it opened my eyes to a whole bunch of things that the left and the right won't tell you, you won't find in the mainstream media, the corporate press, as Michael Malice coined. And it led me to where I am today, talking to you about liberty on a podcast. <laughs> for the Libertarian Party of Georgia. Um, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy where the world takes you. But, uh, man, we've got a good month planned for you. Um, as I said at the beginning, Mr. Edgar Mills will be joining us on Tuesday for our Tuesday release of this podcast. Um, 
talk about guns, how it relates to Georgia, Georgians, and just all around Second Amendment stuff. Um, so yeah, I hope you tune in for that. Again, apologies for the late release of this episode. I hope everybody had a fantastic 4th of July here in Georgia. Um, I spent it with my family and it was wonderful um, doing home renovations and then eating some burgers and watching some fireworks. It's about the best America there can be. So that about does it for tonight. If any of the topics that I've been talking about intrigued you, if you have any questions, concerns, um, if you just want to tell me that you hate me, um, drop us a line. LP Georgia on Twitter, and you can hit me up at podcast at lpgeorgia.com. Uh, that'll do it. Make sure you turn tune in next week. See you then. Mm-hmm.